It happened. The unthinkable. The shift that showed our frailty. Nonetheless, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. We are separated. We are isolated. And in this world, we have trouble. Nonetheless, we take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. We are conflicted and frustrated, weary too. But nonetheless, those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. We are down but not out, sidelined but still in the game. We fight for our families, we hold on to love, we strive for kindness, but the hard times get harder. Nonetheless, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We walk through adversity. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. We know to whom we belong and we know where our hope lies. For he is the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the one who is and the one who is to come. It looks bleak, they say it's grim, there's a lot to fear, but nonetheless, we are strong. We are courageous. We are the church. To wrap my mind around what I can do as a leader in the community, what I can do as a pastor and a shepherd to, to you all to, to help bring healing to our country. Help bring healing just to, just to our community, just to our, our body of Christ. And maybe it's just the, 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 the man nature that God has, has placed within me that I, I by nature, I like to fix things. And I wish I could tell you this morning that I've got a profound answer. I wish I could just say, hey guys, if we'll just do this, everything's going to get better. Maybe it's not meant for us to come up with solutions and fix things. Maybe it's meant that we would drive to our knees in prayer. Because see, although I don't have any answers that, that might be a solution to our country, I have a Savior that is greater than anything that we face. He has sent His Spirit to dwell within us that we might display his love to our culture. Uh, we have an avenue that we might touch the throne of God as we hit our knees and we pray and ask the Father to do that which we cannot do. What I do have is the guidance of the scriptures that, that would tell me and guide me to live out the commands of scripture that I might display Christ to our culture. And so I may not have profound answers. I do have God to turn to. And these answers are sufficient if we as the people of God will follow the leading of the Spirit, the commands that we find in the Scriptures, that we are faithful in our prayers, and we ask the Spirit of God to come and to do that which we can. And in our text this morning, several of those answers are on display for us. And I don't, I don't want to super spiritualize the text. I, I don't want to just take a text of Scripture and, and just try to make it say something that, that it doesn't say. But I think you will agree with me by the time we get to the end of this passage this morning that we're going to see the same answers that I've just outlined for us. Now keep in mind. Matthew 8 and 9, it's, it's, it's nine different miracles that Jesus performs. And in between, there's three, in, in, starting in eight, then there's an interruption about what it costs to follow Jesus. There's three more, an interruption about Matthew coming and following Jesus. And then we pick up in our text this morning a question about fasting. And then we're going to look at, at two more miracles. And then the text concludes saying that Jesus... Uh, Jesus saying the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few, so we need to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. 
And so here's where we begin this morning. We wrap our minds around this idea of fasting. That's where the text picks up in verse 14. And specifically what we want to wrap our minds around is New Testament fasting. So here's the main idea of verses 14 through 17. New Testament fasting, that's what I'm going to call us to today. It's what I'm going to ask us to do by the end of the service. New Testament fasting, it involves both mourning over the situation we find ourselves in, but also rejoicing in what our Savior has already accomplished for us. So just follow along with me. So just keep in mind, Jesus has been doing miracles, and in the midst of these healings, uh, everything that Jesus is doing, the text says in verse 14, the disciples of John, this is John the Baptist, they came to Jesus and they say, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but you and your disciples do not fast? So, so just, just think about this just, just for a moment. So by this time, John the Baptist is in prison. And his disciples and some of the Pharisees, they're fasting. They're, they're going without food. Uh, they're mourning. Old Testament fasting it consists of this idea that, that they're mourning and they're asking that God would send the Messiah. And so, remember, Jesus is just having a party with, with Matthew, with the tax collectors, with the sinners. And so, while these guys are fasting and mourning, Jesus and his disciples are, are over here having a party. And it's almost like John's disciples and some of the Pharisees come it's like, Jesus, I don't get it. We're over here uh, mourning and, and asking that God would do something. And here, you and your disciples, you're over here and, and, and y'all are having a, a party. Can you imagine the sense of jealousy welling up in the disciples uh, of John over here, over here as, they, as they're mourning? And in response to that, Jesus basically says, verse 15, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Throughout the Old Testament, God had pictured himself as, as a husband or the groom, and his bride would be Israel. So, for example, Hosea says, In that day, this is the Lord's declaration, You will call me my husband. I will take you to be my wife forever. I will take you to be my wife in righteousness, in justice, in love, and compassion. I will take you to be my wife in faithfulness, and you will know Yahweh. And so here's what Jesus says. There, there will be a day that Jesus, that the bridegroom will be taken away and then they will fast. But at this moment, the bridegroom has come. God has stepped out of heaven. He is walking with his disciples and there's no way that they can mourn in the midst of the Messiah that is with them. And then he gives two illustrations. They, put, they point to the same thing. You can't put a piece of unshrunk cloth uh, on, a, uh, on, on a piece of, on an old garment for that will tear away the garment. The tear will be worse. And you can't put new wine into old wine skins. They both point to the same reality. Uh, the new covenant with Christ, it, it is too fresh to be attached to the traditions uh, that these Pharisees go through. Uh, this new covenant by the, by the blood of Christ, the, this new wine of His presence, it is, it is too powerful to be placed in an old and religious and, and, and inflexible system. And so we, as new covenant believers in Christ, we fast. Remember, fasting is, is doing without, without physical food, asking that God would make His presence known. So we fast, but we don't mourn just like the, like the old covenant these guys fasted. We fast with a sense of, of rejoicing that, that the Messiah has come. But then there is a sense in which we mourn as well. So let's just think about that. We know Christ has come. That he died in our place on the cross. That he was resurrected three days later. That our faith in him has brought about our restoration with the Father. We have tasted the new wine of his presence. And when we fast, we rejoice, right? Right? This is where you say yes. Yes, yes. We rejoice. Man, our sins have been forgiven. God stepped in our place, gave his life on a cross, and, and we're fasting. We're asking God to make his presence known in our life. But at the same time, there is a future element to our fasting that involves mourning. The world that we live in is broken. 
the suffering and pain all around us, there's sickness, there's addiction, sexual sin, racism, hatred, the list could go on and on and on. And you know what we do? We cry. We mourn. And we fast. And we ask, come Lord Jesus, come quickly. And we long for the day when every injustice will be made right. We long for the day when every sin will be wiped away. We, we long for the day when, when Christ returns and there will be no more sickness. We, we long for that day. And that's what we do when we fast. We rejoice that, that Christ has come and he has, he has made a way possible for us to be forgiven and be redeemed and, and for our relationship to be restored. But we also fast and we, and we mourn because we see the wickedness of our world and we want to say, Jesus, please come. I never... Ask Jesus to come more than I think I have this week. Jesus, please come and do away with all of the, the division that we see. Do away with all of, all of the pain and the heartache that we see in our world. Jesus, only you can come and make things right. So here's what I want to ask you to do this week. Sometime within the next six days, would you take a day and fast? It's a day of fasting where you, you rejoice at what God has already done for you, but you, you ask that the Lord would, that the Father would intervene in the brokenness of our country, the brokenness of our world. Ask the Father to work in your life to expose any sin that you have. And then we rejoice at what we've been given in Christ. Rejoice that there is still hope in this world. Rejoice that our Savior is returning. Rejoice at this great salvation we've been given in Christ. Remember this. This verse came to my mind as I was preparing this. In 2 Corinthians 10.4, Paul said, The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. But let me read that again. Make sure you get this. The weapons of our warfare, they're not of the flesh. We can't create policy. That's going to bring unity in our country. We, 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 we can't create programs that's going to cause our hearts to love people who don't look like us. The weapons of our warfare, they're not of the flesh, but they're spiritual. They have divine power to destroy strongholds. You, you see, the battle that we see in our culture is not just physical. It is spiritual warfare. Do you understand that? Paul said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. Paul knew that behind every, every physical attack he faced, there was demonic warfare behind that. And we're kidding ourselves if we think we as the church, that we have a solution to fix if it doesn't involve spiritual warfare, us hitting our knees. Asking that the Spirit of God would intervene in the midst of everything we see. We have to hit our knees in prayer and in fasting. All right, so let's move to these miracles. There's two miracles, picking up verse 18. Jesus is teaching. And he's saying these things to the crowd. And, and there's a ruler. It's, it's Jairus. He's a ruler of the synagogue. He comes in and what the text says in verse 18 is he comes down. He kneels before Jesus and he says, my daughter has just died. But come, Jesus, come and, and lay your hand on her that she may Live. Even the scribes who are really described as the enemies of Jesus, even, even they, in a moment of desperation, they will turn to Jesus. And of course, the text says, verse 19, Jesus rises and follows him. However, he's on the way. Now, now imagine you're J. Irish. You can't wait for Jesus to get there. And, and they're on the way. And there's a, we, met a, we meet a lady in verse 20. She's had a flow of blood, her monthly cycle, 12 straight years, nonstop. Some of y'all sympathize with her very much. Okay? Luke records there was nobody that could help her. Mark says that her condition was getting worse and worse. 
But her, her, her problem was not just physical. It certainly was physical, but it was, it was spiritual. It was social as well. Jewish law, this lady was ceremonially unclean. She's not allowed to go to the temple. She's not allowed to participate in the, re, the Jewish religious life. It's almost certain she had no friends. Nobody could touch her uh, because, if, according to the law, if somebody touched her, that person came to be defiled as well. But she had a great faith. She was so desperate. If I could just get to him. If I could just work my way through the crowd. If I could just touch the, just the corner of the coat that he's wearing. If I could just touch the smallest part. I can be healed. And so you can just, in your imagination, you can imagine the crowd around Jesus, Jairus right there, the disciples right there, and all the people Jesus is teaching, and this lady working her way through the crowd, trying to be careful not to touch anybody. And, and I, love, I love Mark. I love how Mark describes this scene when, when she touched Jesus. It's almost Jesus felt power go out of him and, and Jesus turned around. Who touched me? And the disciples say, Jesus, you see everybody pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? Everybody's touching you. And it's almost like you can see this lady. How do you... I, I, I touched you. And she explained the situation. And Jesus looks at her in verse 22. Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. Instantly, this woman was made well. This lady was healed because not she, because she physically touched Jesus, but because in her faith, she brought her problems to Jesus. Now imagine if you're in the midst of this and you're Jairus and your daughter's at home. You're like, lady, I'm glad you got your healing, but if we got something else we need to take care of. Okay? Mm -hmm. Y'all relate? Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus, we, we need to get going. My daughter's at home, lifeless. So you know he wants Jesus to hurry up and get to where he is. And when they get there, when you get to the text, verse 23, uh, the, uh, he gets to his house, the flute players and the crowd, they're making this commotion. There's a, it's the funeral commotion. that They hire the flute players to come in. That, you know, it's, it's, it's not, like, it, it's not like, like us. We call the funeral home, right? They call it a commotion committee, right? They're bad, but they call it a committee. <laughs> uh, they, they call this commotion to come in and, and there's flute players and there's dancing and, and things like all of that. And, and Jesus gets there and he's like, hey, quit playing. Calm down. Quit mourning. Uh, th this girl's not dead. Uh, she is just asleep. And they begin to mock him. They begin to laugh at him is what the text says at the end of uh, uh, verse 24. And he, think about it, Jesus had healed diseases, he had calmed the raging storms, he had cast out demons, but in their mind, this miracle worker, there's no way that he can raise somebody back to life. They know this girl is dead, there's no life in his, his body. In, 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 in their mind, Miss Judy, it's almost like they were thinking, this miracle worker is getting ready to embarrass himself. Jesus, he puts the crowds away, they go outside. He goes verse 25. He went in and he takes her by the hand. And that which was lifeless, which was dead, came back to life. And she arose. And the, verse 26 says, and the reports of this went out through all that district. James Montgomery Boyce, he points out that within these two miracles, we see the destruction of sin in our country. Now notice what he says, and these are his points. And, uh, I've tweaked them just to make sure that they're alliterated you can remember them. Think about sin as we see it in this text. Sin defiles us. This lady that had a flow of blood for 12 years, she was defiled. That's what we would say. She's, she's contaminated. Uh, she, uh, she was unclean 
by Jewish law. And if you were to take out a mirror this morning, that's what you would see in that mirror. That's what you would see in your life. Sin has contaminated every single one of us. Anybody that has a heartbeat, if you were to look in the mirror, you would see a reflection of somebody uh, that sin has defiled in our world. We are, we are spiritually contaminated because of the sin in our lives. Sin brought this lady division. She probably had no friends. No one could touch her. She couldn't go to the temple and worship. She was completely isolated from everyone else. And in the same way, sin divides us. Ultimately, sin brings division between us and our God. Isaiah says that our sins have separated us from our God so that he has hidden his face from us. And there's no greater division. Are you listening? There is no greater division in our world than a man being separated from his creator. It's the biggest division we have. We would, I would be remorse, remorseful or remiss if I didn't say our country is one great big division. We're divided among racial lines. We're divided, divided among political lines. We're divided among social status. Even Christians are divided by their denominations. And then when conflict happens in a local body of church, many Christians just divide. Sin brings division in our world. And then notice this last thing. Sin brings death. When you walk in sin, when you disobey the commands of God, the inevitable result is going to be death. Sometimes that means it will be physical death. Like, for example, if you try to break into somebody's house and, and you're, you know, sinning in that capacity, you're putting your life on the line when you sin, but your ultimate death is separation from God for all of eternity in hell. If you don't deal with the problem of your sin by surrendering your life to Jesus, you will face spiritual death. And we see that in these two miracle situations. And so here's the question we're left with. What do we do with our sin? What do we do with this devilment, this division, this death? Well, we take it to Jesus. When we bring the results of our sin to Jesus, I want you to hear what we say. Pay close attention to what I'm getting ready to say. When you bring your defilement, when you bring your division, you bring your death to Jesus, here's what you find. Number one, Jesus was defiled so that you no longer have to be defiled. When Jesus hung on a cross for our sins, He became defiled in our place. And when we, by faith, surrender our life to Jesus, the defilement that brought death to our life, Jesus takes the death that we deserve because of our sin. He was defiled so that we no longer have to live in our defilement. Jesus was defiled so that you and I don't have to be defiled anymore. We bring him our divisions. And we find that he faced division so that we no longer have to. When he was arrested and on trial, he was divided. He was separated from his followers. His disciples deserted him. As he was as he hung on a cross for the sins of humanity, he was divided from his family. His mother standing there watching and weeping as she was divided from her son. And he, uh, she no longer able to do anything about it. As he hung on a cross, the greatest division he suffered was when the father had to turn the, his back on his son as his son became sin for us. He was divided from his father so that we don't have to be. He faced the division of the world so that when we come to Him by faith, we're no longer divided from the world. We're united to one another in Christ. So that, you see this, within the body of Christ, there, there should be no color. It is no longer, you're a black Christian, you're a white Christian, you're a Hispanic Christian. We're Christians first. 
That is our number one identity. We are followers of Christ. Now, is there still diversity? Yes. But, but our makeup is first of all identified as a follower of Jesus. He faced the division of the world. He faced the separation of the Father so that we don't have to face that division. We are to be united in Christ around His love and His commands, united to our Father who is in heaven. He was defiled for us. He was divided for us. And He faced death so that you and I don't have to. We don't have to pay the penalty of our sin. He died on a cross on our behalf so that we could look death in the face and with confidence knowing that our physical death is only the entrance point into the life that is to come in Christ. This is what we do with our sin. We take our sin and we bring it by faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the saddest parts of my conversation with those the two African American ladies this week, and then also with a lady that's sitting in this room this morning, is a lack of hopelessness that I heard. Not just that I heard, that they physically said. I just don't have any hope anymore for this world. I don't have any hope. Master, do you think it's going to get any better? And I confess I felt the same way. I don't know. Lord, if don't get any better. But look at the text. Jesus goes, he takes this girl by the hand, and she rises. Mm -hmm. Foreshadowing the resurrection of our Savior. Mm -hmm. Every one of you in this room, you claim to be a follower of Jesus. Pretty sure every one of you in this room you claim to be a a follower of Jesus. You know what that means? Your confession is. Your confession. This is what you believe. You believe that Jesus came and died on the cross for your sins. Right? Everybody agree with that? Yeah. I mean, not, he didn't just pass out on the cross. He gave his life on the cross. He was, he was dead as dead could be. Right? This is what we believe. This is confessional Christianity. This is what we believe. They took his lifeless body off of the cross, put it in a borrowed tomb, sealed the entrance, placed Roman guards there so that nobody could come and steal the body. But remember the song? On that first Sunday morning, The stone was rolled away. And the ladies come to the tomb and they look in. And the angels, who are you looking for? We're, we're looking for Jesus. He is not here for He has risen. By your confession, you believe that Jesus died on a cross, buried in a tomb, and was raised in newness of life. That is what we believe. And so, just, just, just hear, hear what I'm telling myself. Hear what I'm trying to minister to my heart, may minister to your heart, if this is what we believe. Are you really telling me, I mean, I'm speaking to myself, are you really telling me that the God who took a lifeless body and raised it back to life again can't bring unity in our culture? Are you telling me that, that we don't have any hope that our Heavenly Father can't restore unity in our world, but He can raise a dead man back to life? Because of Christ. Mm -hmm. Only because of Christ. 
there is hope. We walk out of this room, the God who raised Jesus back to life is able to raise up in in our country. Don't walk out like your pastor. Walk out in hope because of Christ. Not in anything else, because of Jesus. Father,